My name is Adrienne Windsor. I'm a member of the board of the foundation, and I have the privilege of introducing our speakers tonight. Uh, we always start by thanking our generous sponsors, Mike and Polly Smith. And I want to say a little word about them, if I may. Uh, Mike and Polly have been with medicine in our backyard since it first started. Uh, we are going to be celebrating them this summer at a summer solstice, which is on June 14th, honoring them for their great contribution to us. And uh, I always say this is a membership organization, and uh, how many of you are members? And how many of you aren't? Well, you won't, well, okay. <laughs> so what we'd like you to do is join tonight, and I'll tell you why. The summer solstice is a new event. This will be our second year. It's to celebrate new members of the foundation and to bring them together with members of the foundation staff, library staff, our major donors, so that we can all get acquainted. And this year, we are featuring as a speaker, Susan Strait, who is the author of Mecca, a novel that was listed just yesterday in the New York Times is one of the six paperback books to read this week. So uh, it should be a great evening, and if you're a new member, you will be invited. So please join. Please join with us. Now, let me tell you a little bit more. If you become a member, you are the first to learn about our lecture series, our library live series, and our witty series. And we have a weekend coming up with Christine Mittermeier on March 31st and April 1st, that's Friday and Saturday. Uh, she is a pho photographer and conservationist, uh, written for the Atlantic, and uh, she will be here Friday night and Saturday afternoon. We would love to have you attend. And then at the end of April, we have a substitution the Dr. Dasher Keltner, who is a psychologist and co-director of, get this, the Greater Good Center at Berkeley, uh, is going to come and speak about the promise and peril of power in the 21st century. So this is another witty lecture you can be looking forward to. And um, we would just like you to become part of our community, so we hope you'll join us. Now, the question and answer period will be at the end of the presentation tonight, so save your questions until then. If you haven't silenced your cell phone, please do that right now. And then I am pleased to present our two speakers this evening, Drs. Demisha Parekh and Stephen Mills. Now, Dr. Demisha Parekh is a board-certified UCI Health gastroenterologist who directs the UCI Health Inflammatory Bowel Disease Program. She is also the Fellowship Program Director and serves as the Associate Dean of Faculty Development. She earned her medical degree from Tulane University School of Medicine in New Orleans and completed an internship and residency in internal medicine at Tulane Medical Center. She also completed a fellowship in gastroenterology and hepatology at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School in Dallas, Texas, <clears throat> followed by advanced training in the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease at the University of Chicago Department of Medicine. When you look at this beautiful woman, you'll say, how can someone so young and gorgeous have accomplished so much in, in this lifetime that she's had? Our second speaker is Dr. Stephen Mills. He is a UCI Health Surgical Director of Inflammatory Bowel Disease Program and Director of Colon and Rectal Surgery Fellowship Program. He received his medical degree from New York Medical College, Bahala, New York. He completed residency training at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. He then completed specialized fellowship training in colon and rectal surgery at the University of Southern California. Now tonight they will be speaking on 
getting a grip on Crohn's disease. And I, I really congratulate all of you who are willing to come out tonight and, and confront the issue of bowels. I think it's something we always <laughs> wish we didn't have to talk about. <laughs> and these two wonderful people are going to lead our discussion tonight. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Preck and Dr. Mills. Well, thank you all for having us. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Adrian. We're really excited to be here today. And today, Dr. Mills and I are gonna do a joint presentation. So we're gonna tag team and in show how we integrate, how we approach Crohn's disease. And this is actually how we both practice. We practice together. So we're giving you a little uh, flavor of our style as we practice medicine. So. Today we're going to just kind of go over the agenda, what topics we're going to cover, because Crohn's disease is a very large topic. And so I always like to think a little bit about history, epidemiology, and what is the disease itself. And then Dr. Mills is going to talk about anatomy and inflammation. And then I'm going to talk about the different medical therapies. He's going to talk about surgical therapies, and then we're going to do a joint wrap up. And so uh, we hope, and then we'll answer your questions to the best of our abilities at the end. So, you know, if you think about, a lot of people don't actually know that Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, we've actually known about it for quite some time. Uh, the earliest description of ulcerative colitis was made by Hippocrates in 460 BC. And then in the 19th century, more theories were put forward by various physicians and surgeons about the inflammation of the GI tract. Uh, Sir Samuel Wilkes wrote the first case report using the term ulcerative colitis in 1859. In 1909, there was a case series of over 300 cases of ulcerative colitis were presented at the Royal Society of Medicine in London, describing presenting symptoms to treatment attempts. In that same year, sigmoidoscopy, which is a type of procedure we do, was demonstrated to be safe and a very invaluable tool for colon evaluation and diagnosis. Now, over the next 40 years, we learned more about ulcerative colitis in, 19, in the 1940s. We got better descriptions of you know, the anatomy, the pathology, the physiology, and then we started learning more about ulcerative colitis through radiology imaging. Now, as for Crohn's disease, the earliest description is actually credited to Giovanni Battista Morgani, who is considered the father of anatomic pathology, uh, where he describes a case of a 20-year-old male who died of fever, abdominal pain, and diarrhea, and his autopsy revealed perforations or holes in his colon, and it had inflammation through all the different layers. And so we're going to go through the anatomy, and Dr. Mills will explain you know, what a perforation is. And it also had ulcerations. Now, the landmark article written by Burl Crohn's, Leon Giz Ginsberg, and Gordon Oppenheimer identified Crohn's disease to the world uh, when it was presented to in an article in JAMA in October 1932. And the reason it's you know called Crohn's disease is Dr. Crohn's was the first one on the on the paper, but it's the whole group that actually discovered this. And so and he, his name was first based on alphabet, believe it or not. So that's some of the history there. Um, and they described 14 patients who had inflammation in their colon, and they also had strictures and fistulas. And then what's also interesting is during the 1930s and 50s, we learned more about the GI tract, about inflammation, physiology. We learned how to investigate the colon with different technologies. And then we started learning about different medications. And one of the earliest medications that was used for treatment of Crohn's disease is called sulfasalazine. And actually, sulfasalazine was discovered by a Swedish rheumatologist. Uh, in the late 1930s for the treatment of infective polyarthritis. And so, you know, we've been using, sulfasalazine actually is one of the oldest drugs that we've been using, and you'll hear about some of the newer drugs as we go through our discussion today. So what we do know about Crohn's is currently in the United States, it does affect anywhere between 1 to 1.5% 1 of the population. 
So if you think in Orange County, we have a population of approximately 3 million people. So 30,000 people are affected by this condition, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Historically, this disease was a disease of the northern latitude. So historically, we say it was a disease of northern Europeans. However, in the last 50 to 60 years, we are seeing a shift. We are seeing Crohn's disease in areas we didn't see it before. So on this chart, you'll see in the areas that are more of that beige color, like in Asia, China, India, you know, in South Africa, we are now seeing Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, where 50 years ago we didn't see this disease. And this partly has to do, we think, with the different environmental changes, changes in the way we eat, the changes in the way food is processed. And so now we see it in all different populations. Okay. So how do we make this diagnosis? In very, it's a complex disease. P patients do not all present the same. Some people may present with abdominal pain. Some people will present with rectal bleeding. Some people will present with weight loss, anemia, diarrhea. So we have to do a thorough history and physical. Then we end up doing a lot of different blood tests, stool tests. We want to rule out infections. Then we may do a colonoscopy or endoscopy, and that's what the pictures up at the top here are showing. And at times we use radiologic imaging, such as MRI or CT scan, to help us make this diagnosis as well. So I'm just showing you a flavor of like, this diagnosis sometimes can be difficult because the symptoms are very different from person to person. Now on endoscopy, which is, or colonoscopy, which is the tool that we use very, you know, a lot to help us diagnose, we have, different patterns of disease that we're looking for. So in ulcerative colitis, the disease will start in the rectum and go all the way up. In Crohn's disease, it can be what we call a patchy inflammation. It may show cobblestoning or a stricture. And we also use different scoring systems to grade the severity of the disease as mild, moderate, or severe. And the reason that's important is as we go to the section on medical therapies, that helps us choose which therapy may be best for our patients. Also with Crohn's disease, we have a lot of extra intestinal manifestations. And so if any of you know anyone with Crohn's disease, you know that your family member or friend may have other symptoms as well. They may get joint pains, they may get skin rashes, they can get eye problems such as uveitis or iritis or scleritis, which is inflammation in different parts of the eye. Patients with Crohn's disease are a little bit higher risk for developing kidney stones. Uh, they can get liver disease, a specific liver disease called primary sclerosing cholangitis. And so we have to pay attention not just to our patients' colons. We do have to pay attention to all these other extra intestinal manifestations as well. Now, Crohn's disease we're going to focus on can affect any part of the GI tract. So we say it can affect anywhere from mouth to anus. Uh, patients can, as we said, I said they can present with various symptoms because they can have different manifestations. They may have a stricture. They may just have ulcerations. They may have what's called a fistula. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mills, and he's going to go over some basic anatomy, and then he's going to talk about what are strictures and what are fistulas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we, we mentioned that it can, it can affect anywhere. That includes basically anything from what we say that the mouth to the anus or the front to the back or the top to the bottom. So mouth, esophagus, stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine, or even the anus, which is the, basically the opening where everything comes out at the end. And because it can affect any of these places, as, as Dr. Park was mentioning, you can have a lot of different presentations. Somebody with a problem in their stomach will show up very differently than somebody with a problem in their rectum, but they could be the exact same process that's causing this, the symptoms in both those two patients. So it can make the figuring it all out a little bit difficult. But to take a step back and try to understand how, how these things happen, if we look at the normal intestine, so this is, this is uh, like a cross-section of the small intestine, but the colon is more or less the same in terms of the parts I'm going to talk about. The colon is sort of like the wall of a building. You have paint, you've got wallboard, you've got insulation, and then you've got the outside wall. It's got layers just like the, other, the regular wall. Ulcerative colitis only affects the innermost layer, what we call the mucosa, which is just the inside lining. Like So the stool and food that goes through touches that, that layer. And that's the only part that is affected with ulcerative colitis. But with Crohn's disease, like Dr. Park mentioned from 
uh, Morgagni's uh, paper, he found full thickness inflammation. The full thickness of the wall can be involved with the inflammation from Crohn's disease. And as, as inflammation starts, the, the first set of inflammation, so what we call acute inflammation, is the bringing in of inflammatory cells, so part of your immune system shows up in the intestines, and it's turned on, and it, and it does the things that it does, which basically, in this setting, brings inflammation. So inflammation is basically edema, so swelling. And as it swells, the outside of the intestine is fairly rigid, so it can't really stretch out. So as you watch this orange bar, the orange line here, you'll see that as the swelling in the wall becomes more and more, the lumen or the inside diameter of the intestine actually becomes smaller and smaller to the point where you can get a narrowing or a stricture stenosis, a narrowed area in the intestines when you have really bad inflammation. But then somebody comes along and gives you some anti-inflammatory medications um, in the very acute setting, this is often something like prednisone, which is a type of steroid, or maybe it's a sulfasalazine, or whatever they give you that, that works for this. And as that inflammation goes down, the swelling then goes down, and you start to see the, the opening up of, of this area with the hope that well, Dr. Park will go through the medication uh, treatment. But when you get to a medication that now treats this, prevents it, so you, you treated it with the acute problem, you treated it with the steroids and got rid of the inflammation, but now you need a medication to sort of keep it at bay or keep it in remission. And when you have that good medication, the intestines stay like this, no inflammation, no swelling, and the lumen or the inside diameter is wide open. Sometimes people will get inflammation that doesn't go away with medications or stays at kind of a low level. And as inflammation stays for a long time, the cells that come in, which initially came in and were bringing swelling or edema, those cells switch out and new cells come in which say, okay, well, we're gonna be here for a long time, we're gonna make this easier, and they actually set up scar tissue. So now you have, instead of just extra fluid and swelling that makes the diameter smaller, you start to get scar tissue within the wall of the colon. And this, you can see here, you have a little bit of scar tissue, a little bit more scar tissue, now there's a lot of scar tissue. And scar tissue is hard and it, you can't really dissolve scar tissue with medications, at least not at this point. So you see here, you have somebody who now has a very small diameter or has a narrowing, and a narrowing is what we call a stricture. And if somebody has a narrowing, it's kind of like having a problem in a pipe. If you have a problem in a pipe, you know that when you, when you try to get your sink to drain or your, or your bathtub to drain, it takes forever for that stuff to go through. Well, if you're somebody with Crohn's disease and you've got a stricture like this, whether it's acute or chronic, but these chronic ones are usually more of a problem uh, with, with, this, with what I'm about to describe, but you start to have problems with the food going through your intestines. So if you have a blockage or a partial blockage like this at the end of your small intestine, you eat and it goes through, okay, it empties from your stomach pretty well, but it, you stay bloated and you've got you know, um, maybe some cramps or maybe some nausea, maybe eventually gets bad enough where you're, you're vomiting, but your intestines are trying to push stuff through this, but it's a narrowed area. So the pressures to get stuff through are higher and you start to get crampy feeling and stuff like that. The other problem with inflammation is that sometimes the inflammation, as you mentioned, goes fully through the entire side of the, or thickness of the wall. And inflammation is kind of like welding. If you have two pipes next to each other and you get one pipe hot enough, if they're made out of the right things, you will eventually erode through the wall of the one pipe and into the wall of the other pipe. And you can actually have the two pipes come together to make one opening inside of it or one lumen. And it's in this setting of intestines, when you have two pieces of intestine getting, getting together with inflammation, it's usually only one side is inflamed, but it gets inflamed enough that it actually gets a little hole in it because there's a weak spot from all of that in, inflammatory, the inflammatory cells are breaking down the, the connections between the intestine, between the cells, and you get a weak spot, and that weak spot can lead to what we call a perforation or, a, or a, like a pop, and you can get an abscess. Sometimes that will happen so slowly that as it's eroding through that little bit of intestine where the weak spot is, it actually will overflow into the piece of intestine that's next to it. And those inflammatory cells that are really over here are now causing a problem here. Sort of like if your house is on fire and, and your neighbor's house catches on fire. Your neighbor's house wasn't on fire to start with, but it was it's in the wrong neighborhood. When that happens between two pieces of intestine, you can actually get scarring around that that leads to a, a tunnel from one piece of intestine to something else, another piece of intestine, to the skin, to the bladder, to the fallopian tubes or uterus, or really to pretty much anything. 
Uh, that usually requires removing that area, which I'll talk about it a little bit later. But one more, one more picture of, of a fistula, basically you see that as the intestinal contents, simply we have a pointer here, as the intestinal contents are passing through here, because there's an opening, they can go from one side to the other, which then will bypass a portion of intestine. And that process of having two, th two tubes connected is called a fistula, which we'll come back to a little bit later on. Let me get back to you. All right. So many times our patients feel like this. They can have, they can go from zero to 60. They can be well one day, and then the next day they can feel just miserable. They can have abdominal pain, diarrhea, you know, bleeding. So our goal is for our patients not to feel this way, and our goal is for our patients to feel better. But also I didn't mention earlier is, you know, we didn't talk about what causes ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So we actually don't know, but we do know there's a genetic predisposition. So there's something in people's genetics. We know that Crohn's disease runs higher in Ashkenazi Jewish patients. We know that, as I said earlier, it was a disease of Northern Europeans. And so when we see our patients, we ask, where is your family from? Where are you from? Just to see if there's a genetic component. Do other family members have this disease? We also know that there's this genetic predisposition and then something goes haywire in your immune system. So a switch gets flipped in your immune system and then your immune system decides to attack some part of your intestinal tract, either it be the stomach, the small intestine, or the colon. As it attacks it, it causes ulcerations. Those ulcerations are what leads to the symptoms of abdominal pain, diarrhea, and rectal bleeding. Some of these switches could be environmental triggers such as antibiotics, uh, stress, cigarette smoking is actually bad for Crohn's disease and sometimes can trigger it. There are medications such as non steroidal anti inflammatories, ibuprofen, Advil, Aleve, Naproxen. Patients who are taking high doses of those can, that can be a trigger. Uh, whether diet is exactly a trigger, diet is a very complicated topic in Crohn's disease. I'll hit on it a little bit, but there's not a specific diet that says, hey, this would help prevent it, but people are doing studies. Several years ago, there was a French study that showed French women who ate more vegetarian-based diets or plant-based diets had a lower risk of developing Crohn's disease if they were genetically predisposed. So there are lots of different epidemiologic studies like that. So we talked about what is Crohn's, we talked briefly how we diagnose it, we talked about the anatomy, which we find very important because it's important to understand what is acute inflammation and chronic inflammation. So when we have acute inflammation, we do have different medications that we can use, and that's the exciting thing about Crohn's disease right now is that we have a lot of good options. And so I wanted to set the stage with a case. This is one of my real cases of a 35-year-old woman who presented to my office with symptoms of diarrhea and right lower quadrant pain. She also had some joint pain. So you remember the extra intestinal manifestations I mentioned. We did some blood work. She was slightly anemic. Her iron levels were low. Her inflammation markers were high. We did a colonoscopy. This is a picture of her colonoscopy. It shows ulcerations. All those white spots are ulcers in her colon. Then she had a special radiologic study called an MR enterography, a special type of MRI, which showed inflammation in the last part of her ileum, and, but there was no stricture. So remember Dr. Mills talked about what is a stricture or blocked pipe. We didn't see that on evidence on the MRI. So we also ask our patients lifestyle factors. She's very busy. She doesn't want to go to an infusion center. So we have to think about what are the therapies we would give her. So I wanted to set the stage and show how, show how we choose our medical therapies for patients with Crohn's disease. So the first thing we need to do is categorize this as a low-risk patient versus high-risk patients. So high-risk patients are people who are diagnosed at under the age of 30, patients who may have disease in the rectum or they may have perianal fistulas. You heard about those connections from Dr. Mills where there's a tunnel from one part of an intestine to another organ or another part of the intestine. But perianal disease is where you get a connection from the rectum to the, you know, the skin on your bottom. Also, the types of ulcers. You guys have seen various pictures of colonoscopy up here today, but patients who have very these deep cratered ulcers are considered higher risk. Patients who've had surgery before are considered higher risk or patients who've had strictures. 
On the flip side, who are lower risk patients? Those who have very limited disease, they don't have perinatal disease, uh, potentially over the age of 30 at the time of diagnosis, uh, and they have very superficial inflammation. And so as when we do colonoscopy, we are looking at the depth and types of ulcers that we're looking at. And so it's really important for us to categorize our patients as low risk versus high risk. Why is that important? Because it's really important to understand this chart is that many times patients will be like, well, I don't feel that bad, so I really don't wanna go on these medications, I'm worried about the risks or side effects. But from our standpoint, once we make the diagnosis, if we can treat very early in the disease course, we can prevent these long-term complications that Dr. Mills showed you about fistulas and strictures. And so we truly have this window of opportunity to make that change. So he showed you those slides of the acute inflammation. And if we can treat it very quickly in the acute stage and then get you to that maintenance stage where we keep that lumen open, we can hopefully over time prevent those complications of strictures, fistulas, the need for surgery, development of another stricture. And so this picture, I hope you guys remember, this is a slide that is used in almost every medical talk about Crohn's disease, because it's really important to showcase that there really is a window of opportunity where we can make great change. And that's why it's important to think about this when we think about our medicines. Now, another diagnostic tool that is fairly new that we have is something called the CD-PATH Personalized Prognostic Tool. And so there are several different antibody markers that a patient with Crohn's may have. And so there is a lab that has put together a combination of these antibodies, and you can get this tested if you're newly diagnosed with Crohn's or if you know someone newly diagnosed, and they can say, okay, you have X number of antibodies, you have certain genetic markers. In the next three to five years, you are at risk for moderate disease, high severe disease, or low disease. And that also helps us with this risk stratification as we choose our medications. So the first one I showed you is based on like history, physical, and endoscopy in labs. This one is another lab tool that we use occasionally in our patients. Now, the good news in 2023, we have a lot of great drugs. So if you remember my first slide with the history of you know, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, initially we only had steroids and sulfasalazine. Then we got a drug called mesalamine. Then we, got a dr then we used drugs like azathioprine and methotrexate. And now since 1998 has been the advent of biologics. And then since in the last five years, we have even these small molecule therapies. So really the field has expanded and we have so many choices. I can remember when I started working here at UCI in 2007, I had one biologic, just Remicade or infliximab. Now in 2023, I have three different anti-TNFs, uh, an anti-integrin, two anti-IL-23s, soon to be some more small molecules. I have a lot of drugs to choose from. It's very, a very exciting time. And what this chart is showing is, as Dr. Mills mentioned, you know, when do we use, what kind of drugs do we use when it's acutely inflamed? When you're acutely inflamed, we gotta put out the fire quickly. We use steroids because people get well quickly, but we don't like to maintain people on steroids because of the long-term side effects. Uh, we use sometimes drugs of thiopurine, such as azathioprine or 6MP, for maintenance therapy. And then now we're going to go into a little bit more in-depth about the different biologic therapies. And as you see on this chart, most of our biologic therapies we use for both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So it's a really exciting time in the treatment of these diseases. So the first class of biologics are called the anti-TNF agents. So in Crohn's disease, we have three FDA-approved anti-TNF agents. Uh, I'm gonna say their generic name, and then I'm gonna say their trade name, because I think it's important to know both. Infliximab or Remicade, it was approved in 1998 for use in Crohn's. Adalimumab or Humira and then Sertilizumab or Simzia. Now these drugs we've been using for a long time, we use them for a lot of different situations in Crohn's. They're usually our first line therapy for Crohn's. They're our first line therapy for patients who have perianal disease, patients who have joint pains. Uh, this is a really good drug because in other autoimmune conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, psoriatric arthritis, the TNF pathway of inflammation is predominant. So, you know, we use this not just in Crohn's, but a lot of other autoimmune conditions. 
this drug is safe to take in pregnancy. That is a very important message for us to get out there because many people are like, oh, we can't take it. There's a lot of data in the Crohn's disease literature, in the RA literature, in the psoriasis literature showing the safety and efficacy during pregnancy because it's worse for a mom during pregnancy to flare. Remember that picture with the guy with, you know, all turned upside down? You don't want to have that during a pregnancy. That's not good because sick mom means sick baby. We don't want that to happen. And so it's important for us to understand and give this confidence to our patients. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of each drug, but I can say Remicade is an IV infusion. Both Humira and Simsia are injectable drugs. And so different dosings. The nice thing about this class of drugs is we can actually actually measure their drug level in the blood. So we can see, do you have enough blood? Do you have enough drug in your system? Do we change the dosing? And so we're very adept as, at using this class of drugs. In 2014, we got a new drug called Vitalizumab or Intivio. They advertise a lot on TV right now. So anyone who watches a good bit of TV, you're going to hear these drugs there. Now, this was the first biologic, which was exciting because it was approved for both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease at the same time. Usually one gets approved for one disease and then the other. So this is a very interesting category of drugs. And it was, it's given as an infusion, very, very safe. It's one of our safest biologics that we like to use. It's also safe in pregnancy. It has very few side effects. And basically what this drug does is it blocks the cells that lead to inflammation. And so the other exciting thing about this drug is it's gut specific. So it only works for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. We don't use it for any other autoimmune conditions. So if we have a patient with Crohn's disease who's having severe joint pains, this may not, even though it's a very safe drug, this may not be the best drug for that patient because we got to treat both their GI symptoms and their joint pains. Now, the drug, as I said, is an IV formulation. In the next one to two years, it's going to be an injectable. So it's going to be a game changer for people so they don't have to go to the infusion center to get this drug. Now, the newest class of biologics are called the anti-IL-23 drugs. So currently, we have two FDA-approved drugs. One is Ustekinumab or Stolara, and the second one is Rizikizumab or Skyrizi. So Stolara was approved in 2016 for Crohn's, and Skyrizi was actually just approved in June of 2022, so really brand new. This blocks a different pathway of inflammation, anti or the IL-23 pathway. Both of these drugs are given, it's a hybrid type drug. We give a couple, for Stellar, we give one infusion followed by an injection every eight weeks. With Skyrizi, we give three infusions followed by an injection about every eight weeks as well. Very safe drug we find, very well tolerated, and also has really good efficacy for management as well. So this class of drugs is actually the game changer right now in Crohn's because in the next Three years, you're going to see probably three more of these anti-IL-23s come out for not just IBD, but they're already out for psoriasis, and we're going to see them out for rheumatoid arthritis. So there's a drug called Tremphia, which is already approved for uh, psoriasis. We should be seeing that approved for Crohn's soon. And there's another one by Eli Lilly. They haven't put out their name yet, but that's going to be approved in the next year as well. So we have a lot of different choices in this class. So... These are our three big biologic classes. Now, I mentioned small molecules, or you saw in my chart that we have small molecules. Small molecules are, they're not biologic, so they don't build up immunogenicity. We can go on and off those drugs. They are currently only approved for ulcerative colitis, but we are gonna see some of these small molecules get approved for Crohn's disease in the next one to two years. So if you've anyone been watching TV recently, Rinvoke, for ulcerative colitis and RA. It's coming for Crohn's. We're also going to have filgotinib. So we have a lot of other drugs coming our pathway, in our pathway to use. And so the commercials, I think, actually are kind of helpful because it helps people understand what's, you know, coming to market as well. Now, one thing I wanted to talk about are biosimilars. So, you know, in other types of medicines, like for diabetes, hypertension, we have trade and then we have generics and so 
Biosimilars are kind of in those types, that's kind of how we categorize it, but we don't like to say it's a generic of biologics, but it's a biosimilar. And what that means is it's the molecule structure is very similar to the parent molecule. And so they're being used around the world because partly because of cost and the safety profile is the same. So if a patient has to switch from Remicade to its biosimilar, it's totally fine. We've been doing that in the last few years. In 2023, Humira, which is now going off patent, is gonna have 10 biosimilars come to market in the next one year. So it makes my life challenging because we gotta get insurance authorization and know which one is what and answer the phone calls. But to give everyone information, it's safe, it's okay to switch back and forth. Uh, very rarely do people have problems when they go to the biosimilar. But it's important to know that it's there and your insurance may say, you know what, we're not gonna pay for infliximab or Remicade, but we'll pay for Inflectra, or we'll pay for Renflexis. And so that's coming for anyone who is on Humira. So Amgen is the first one to market and then we're gonna get nine more later this year. Now, when we think of therapies, the number one question is safety. So I like this pyramid to show the safety profile. So actually, even though steroids work really well, people feel better on steroids, they're actually our least safe drug. And why is it the least safe drug? You know, anyone who's been on steroids are like, I don't feel that bad, I feel great. I have good energy, I'm hungry, so I'm gaining weight, I'm happy, maybe a little energetic, I get a lot of things done. <laughs> Uh, maybe your partners or your family are like, oh, they're kind of grouchy, but long-term steroids, they can increase risk for diabetes, increase blood pressure. It eats away at your bones over time and can cause osteoporosis. It can cause early cataract formation. It increases your risk of developing infections as well. So we don't, I want to point out, even though patients feel better, we do use these, but this is not a good, from a safety standpoint, it's actually probably our least safe drugs. Our biologics are actually safer, even though you hear that laundry list, you know, on the commercials, or you see the big list on Google, the risks and side effect profiles of these medications include, and you hear the long list, it scares you. But this really is how, when we see how we use these drugs, you know, it's important to think about. Yes, it is important to think about safety. And as we think about these therapies, we talked about low risk versus high risk. I have to think about age of the patient. I have to think about, you know, lifestyle factors, family planning, do they have a history of cancer? You know, we also have to think about insurance. We have to think about, is that patient malnourished? Because if they're severely malnourished, some of these drugs won't work for them. And really early therapy is really important, but our goal is really to get patients on steroid sparing therapy. So what are the things I do when I think about, you know, a patient who's sitting in my office like the patient I presented? I have to think about patient preference, the efficacy, which drug will be most efficacious, what's the clinical trial data. I pre presented some of it briefly to you in those charts. What's the patient's current symptoms? What's really bothering them? What's their long-term prognosis? What's their risk for high-risk complications? Safety and then the payer preferences as well. So a lot of decisions go into our you know, decision-making process as we choose a biologic. Another way to think about it is positioning of how quickly someone needs to get well. Do they have you know, other, other extraintestinal manifestations and safety? So this is another chart showing the same thing. Now, when I talk to a patient and I think, okay, how do I figure out if a patient's doing better? What's our target? So when a patient has diabetes or hypertension, we know that anyone with diabetes or hypertension, we say, if you have diabetes, you want to get a hemoglobin less than, hemoglobin A1C less than seven. People know that, right? That's my target. I know my target number. This is what I work towards. For blood pressure, I know my target number. For rheumatoid arthritis, we know we don't want our joints to be swollen. We can see that. Now, in Crohn's disease, you can't see the intestines, but our target is that we heal those ulcers that we see on the colonoscopy. We heal that swelling or that acute inflammation. And so, that, so what I tell my patients are, there's this trifecta, and it comes from this group from the International Organization of IBD, from Stride, saying that we should have short-term targets, intermediate targets, and long-term targets. And those short-term targets are first, symptomatic response. Did the patient get better? 
did, then their intermediate targets are, do their labs start to improve? And then the long-term target is, do we have healing of the colonoscopy? So I tell my patients it's the trifecta. I want you to feel well, your labs have to normalize, and your imaging study should be normal. And so it's always good to know what is the goal of the therapy, because if we're not reaching the goal, then we should make a change. Now, the other thing I mentioned, so sometimes what we do is we also can measure the drug level, and so we can adjust the dosing. So I talked about choosing the therapy, but we can also make adjustments in how frequent you need this drug, what dose you may need this drug as well. So there's something called therapeutic drug monitoring, and that's what TDM stands for. And it's well known, and we use it a lot with our anti-TNF agents, so that's the Remicade, the Humira, and the Simsias. Um, but we are starting to use with the other biologics as well. And this helps us make little adjustments. It's just like how you make little adjustments in your blood pressure medicine going up on the dose, going down on the dose. We do the same as well with these biologic therapies. So this was just a very quick snapshot of some of the, of the medications that we use, the decisions that we use to, as we consider what we're gonna use. Because our goal is for our patients to be like this, not like the other guy. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Mills and he's gonna talk about when does a patient need surgery? I talked about the medicines and now he's gonna talk about when surgery is needed. So I'm a colorectal surgeon, so I do a lot of stuff other than just Crohn's disease, and I have a hard time with this picture because we always say if you're reading a newspaper on the toilet, you're gonna have hemorrhoid problems, so just <laughs> maybe, maybe don't, don't get, look too much into that one. All right, so w when you look at these studies that Dr. Park went through, a lot of them define whether or not a medication works as whether or not the patient had to have surgery. So they, they, just, they actually use the word failure as in, in, their, in the study. It'll say failure, surgery is a failure and all this stuff. But we have to really be very clear that you can't really, especially with something like Crohn's disease, you can't look at surgery as a marker of failure. It, it's, it puts a, a lot of negativity on a, on a patient about themselves, like, oh, I have to go have surgery, I'm a bad person, I did something wrong, everything's terrible, but surgery is a tool. It is, it is a, a potential step in a process of, of healing. Just like medications, uh, surgery has risks, and we'll come to some of those in a little bit, but uh, medications have risk, surgery has risk, and it can be a little bit complicated because medications kind of have a low risk each day for a long time, and you don't really think about it much, and surgery has kind of a big tangible risk on Tuesday afternoon at one o'clock. And so it's, it, it's a little bit more complicated when we think about it. But some of the things that we will look at as when does someone need a surgery, it may be really not very complicated things like perforation, meaning the intestines popped. You get pretty sick from that. That one's not very subtle. Hemorrhage or you're, you're bleeding to death. Maybe it's a little bit too dramatic, but you're bleeding and you can't control the bleeding with medications or with a colonoscopy. And sometimes you have to do surgery for something like that. Some patients will have really deep ulcers and the medications aren't really working for them and they have a lot of pain or other symptoms from these ulcers and we have to do surgery for that. Well, we have the word intractable disease. That means we're trying to treat it and it's just not getting any better. So someone that's not improving. Fibrostenotic stricture means they have one of those strictures that was in the gray color that's, that's scar tissue. Those won't get better with medication. So if you're having symptoms from a stricture that, that um, is, a scar, is scar tissue, that one typically needs to have something done to it. Um, fistulas and abscesses. Um, fistulas between two pieces of intestine that aren't causing any symptoms. Can, we can argue if we need to do something for that. It's a pretty bad marker on, a, on imaging. But fistulas around the bottom uh, are, are not real subtle. You've, you're, you know, you've got drainage out of your skin. It, it hurts. It doesn't smell real nice. And it, it's, it's usually very uncomfortable just in general. Those are pretty obvious. Dysplasia and cancer. Dysplasia means precancer. So somebody who has cancer or f from, you know, like colon cancer in the setting of Crohn's disease or someone that has precancer, because both, both of these inflammatory processes, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, can both lead to a higher risk of colon cancer and actually can, for Crohn's disease, can lead to a, a risk of small intestinal cancer. It's, it's a pretty rare, but when it happens, it's, it's more often going to be in someone with Crohn's disease than somebody without it. Um, perianal complications, which I'll, I'll come to at, at the end of my surgical section. It's, it's usually abscesses and, and fistulas. And then rarely in children, some, a child with really bad Crohn's disease may be, have problems with growth and taking out the inflammatory process and helping them no longer have this wasteful area where energy is being used, being inflamed for no real reason. They can actually get a lot of growth out of that because that, that can cause some growth retardation. 
So surgery can seem scary, of course it does, but it doesn't need to be. A little bit of understanding about what surgery is, what you're actually, when someone says we're gonna go in and take out a section of your intestine, like what that actually means and what to expect that day while you're asleep, what's gonna happen, but also what to expect for the next weeks and years after that operation can really help you to get rid of a lot of anxiety. And now you're thinking about getting better rather than thinking about what's gonna happen, like I said, on Tuesday at one o'clock. Medicine and surgery, as I mentioned, both have risks. There are different risks. The whole concept of the risks are different, but they both have them, and it's important to look at them. Neither one of them are bad enough risks that you should not treat something that is making you sick or making you really symptomatic just because you're afraid of the risks of something. Because what you're starting with when, when you're showing up in a doctor's office with a symptom is probably worse than whatever the, the risks are for a lot of these things. And we obviously try to work through those to help you understand what the risks are. And sometimes we say that we can't do that because the risks are too high. Obviously, we have to look at those kinds of things as well. Um, often patients have a choice between changing their medications and doing a surgery. So they, somebody has small intestinal inflammation at the last part of their small intestine, and they have a choice of, okay, I, I took Remicade, it didn't work, now I can switch medications or I can have surgery. Or I haven't started any of the anti-TNFs yet, I can either start one of those or I can have surgery. And it, and it becomes a, a question, and it's really nice to meet a patient as a surgeon before that point where they're coming in with a perforation because they don't really have a whole lot of real good options other than surgery. So to have a chance to talk to somebody, a patient who has to make these decisions when they don't have to make the decision, but they have some time to kind of weigh the pros and cons and what's better for them is really valuable because I can go through, this is what to expect. You know, this is what the surgery would be like. And the patient can say, okay, I, under, I understand now what that is. And now they can go home armed with the information about surgery and the information about a medication. And they can make a really good decision rather than only having information on one side about the surgery only or about the medication only. It's great to be able to, if you have two choices to know about both of them. And it's interesting that, that very recent data, um, this was actually only about a month ago, there is a question of in that, if you think back to that chart that had the window of opportunity, in that window of opportunity, there is some question of whether or not doing early surgery prior to starting a, one of the anti-TNFs, that might actually be beneficial. And it, it, it's, you know, it's a very, very new concept. And there's some questions with the data, but there is, uh, this was a very large study looking actually at a pooling um, seven or eight other studies. And they found that the patients that had early surgery without starting the medications actually seemed to have a better remission afterwards. It's not for everybody, but there, were, there was a group of patients that did better when they had surgery first rather than starting off on Remicade for the first time or something like that. So there is, there is gonna be some information about maybe starting with the surgery will either you know, prevent uh, complications, maybe decrease the need for medications, or maybe prolong the time when a patient has to have either the next surgery or their first surgery. So what procedure is right? I mean, we heard about a bunch of medications, and I don't know how Dr. Parrott keeps them all straight in her head, but she does, thankfully. But we have to figure out about the surgeries, too. There are all kinds of options for surgery. Um, there's laparoscopic and open surgery, so big, big incisions versus little incisions. There are, do we take a section out? That's called a resection. Do we do what's called a stricture plasty, which is a way of repairing, and I'll, I'll put a picture up in just a second about that. Do we need to use a stoma or an ileostomy or a colostomy or, or what would maybe you would just call a bag on the side? Um, all of these things are possible, and we have to figure out which one is the right one. Um, and there's a lot of things to, that go into that decision making. What is the condition of the patient? Is this a patient who's otherwise pretty healthy but has a stricture? Or is this a patient that has been in the, came in through the ER, has been in a hospital not eating for two weeks, and is on really high dose steroids, has an infection, is anemic, and you, you just can, you, you can look at them and tell they're not going to heal any big operations, so they need to have something with much lower risk to it. What is the pa patient's prior history of surgery? Are they gonna have a lot of scar tissue? Have they had a whole bunch of small intestine resected and we're worried about the amount of intestine they have left? What is the extent of disease? Is it one little area that we need to go in and fix? Or is it seven different little areas or one really big area? Is it the small intestine, the colon, or both? Is it the stomach? Is it the esophagus? And then we need to know specifically with their Crohn's disease, what medications have they been on? What medications are they planning on? What are still options? 
when they've had surgeries for it, because they could have also had surgery from that car accident they had when they were when they were 23, and and they had a surgery for that, and so we still have to deal with that. They may not have they may have Crohn's elsewhere, but there's still been a removal of some intestine for some other reason. So something else that kind of goes into the whole milieu of what we have to think about. But typically, for patients with bowel obstruction, so they have one of those narrowings, those strictures. Typically, the most common operation for that is a resection, which means we basically uh, Crohn's disease is not a, does not usually affect the entire area. It is a segmental area, so there will be a section a couple inches long, a foot long, you know, half an inch, whatever, and that will be the area where the inflammation is, and that will be the area where the narrowing is within the intestine. And so we will remove that area, cut it out, and then hook the two ends of the pipe back together. So that is basically a reconnection, which is, this is basically an example. That reconnection is called an anastomosis, which is Latin or Greek or something for making a new hole, but it's basically uh, a reconnection of the intestines, welding the two ends of the pipe back together basically um, to allow continuity or allow the food to go through the intestines still to get past this area that we resected. Sometimes we'll do something called a strictureplasty, and this is particularly important for patients with small or short segment strictures and for patients that have multifocal areas. So they have, instead of one stricture at the end of their small intestine, they have six strictures sort of spread out throughout their small intestine. You can't remove from the first stricture to the last stricture because you'll take out all of their small intestine. The small intestine is very important. You know, we mentioned before that uh, it's where the, or maybe I didn't mention, but it, I should have mentioned, it is the part of the intestines that absorb nutrients. So when you eat and drink and everything, the parts that, that you take out of your food that are important for your health actually get absorbed by the small intestine. The colon is really not all that important for life, but it's, it's a quality of life organ. It's there to hold the poop and allow you to, to sort of make it into something that's more easy to hold on to and then get rid of it at, at your convenience. That's the idea of a colon. The small intestine you have to have because it is what you absorb. And so rarely for people who lose a lot of small intestine, we, uh, for whatever reason, we have to we have something called short bowel syndrome where they don't have enough intestines. So to try to prevent that in one of those patients that has uh, Crohn's over multiple areas, or for a patient that's had every three years for the last decade, they've had uh, a small bowel obstruction, they had to have a section removed. Now you're going in for the fourth or fifth or sixth operation, you start to worry about the amount of intestine they have left. Or somebody who's 15 and they're having their first operation and then 18 and having their second operation, they have a lot of years left that if you don't have good control, you're gonna eventually run out of small intestine. And so we can do a repair of the, of the stricture. So basically what we do here is we do a, we have a blockage here. We make an incision in the blockage and then sew it back together in a way that doesn't remove any intestine but opens up the, the narrowing. There's a bunch of ways that have been described, but the most common way is to make an incision longitudinally here and then pull this out and this out and then sew from here to here. So you make a line going side to side across that. And what that does is it shortens the intestine over that area a little bit, but opens up the diameter of that, of that spot of the intestine. This is not something that all strictures can have. You can't do this in the setting of a fistula, but this is something that is, is a nice option for some patients. I mentioned fistulas, and that's typically one area of, of intestine that's really inflamed, and the other area is usually fine. It just happens to be in the wrong neighborhood. So this is a very inflamed area of small intestine, and there's a tiny little fistula right here that goes to the colon. The colon in this, in this patient, the colon was completely normal. It just happened to be in the wrong area. And so for this one, we were able to divide the, to remove the stricture, or excuse me, remove the fistula, and remove the section of small intestine that had the problem in it, repair the colon, and then reconnect the ends on the small intestine, and the patient did fine. That was, that was a, a really nice way of fixing that without having to have the patient have a bag on the side. So uh, I mentioned lapar laparoscopic or open surgery, just to make sure I'm clear on that. Laparoscopic surgery is basically making small incisions, filling up the abdomen with carbon dioxide or air, placing a camera inside through some little trocars and some long instruments in through some other little trocars. Little trocars are little tubes that go in through the abdominal wall and doing the operation on television. We still do the same operation. We still remove the same amount of intestine, but we basically remove that intestine. We can hook the ends back together. We can sew the intestines, whatever. That portion of intestine still has to come out of the body. So we still make an incision 
it really depends on the size of the patient and the size of the part you're removing, but you make an incision somewhere on their body that is uh, big enough to remove the part you're removing. Usually we do those as a side-to-side -side incision. Uh, we call a fan and steel incision, which is like where a C-section would be. Um, we can also uh, place it in an old incision that maybe wouldn't have been a convenient place to make an incision, so we can reuse incisions that are already there. Uh, we can pretty, pretty much put it anywhere, I and mean, you can try to avoid hernias and stuff like that, but you can do this in a way that the laparoscopic surgery has been shown to be um, less painful, quicker return to you know day-to-day -day life, um, quicker eating, quicker out of the hospital, all these things that, that patients find to be really good, but without sacrificing any of the quality of the operation itself. Lap uh, uh, Crohn's disease was one of the last parts of intestinal surgery to be proven to be safe for, colon or for uh, laparoscopic surgery, so we were very happy to have That's probably been about 15 years ago now, and now the studies on this show that it is actually better to be done laparoscopically if possible. Obviously, that's not an option for every patient or for every situation, but we do that when we can. And then this is sort of the, the scary thing that a lot of people worry about is the ostomy or the stoma. And this is basically bringing the end of the intestine. So if we take out a section of small intestine because of a stricture and the patient is too unhealthy to have a reconnection at that time, for example, we can bring the intestine to the skin. So this is a quarter. And so you bring the intestine up to the skin. Uh, so it basically inside out. So the, the opening of the intestine is there and then the patient can wear an appliance over, over this to collect whatever stool comes out. And this then allows, in, in the situation that I started to say the patient's too sick to have it put back together, this is very safe because there's no reconnection of intestines that has to heal. These, these are very rarely gonna be a problem with it not healing there. So if you have a patient who's very immunosuppressed on high dose steroids, very malnourished, which, which for a lot of Crohn's patients is all three, if somebody come, you know, somebody's very sick when they have this, this is a, a great way of getting a patient well, get rid of the inflammation, get them better, get them healthy, and then often we can go back and do a second operation a few months later and reconnect the intestines and they, and they do fine. Yes, it's, it's an annoyance for a few months, but it's really not that big of a problem. That said, a lot of patients need to have these permanently for various reasons. Maybe they've got Crohn's disease of their, of their anus so badly that their anus is strictured down and there's, you can't remove the anus because there's no place to reconnect the intestines to you past it. So they need to have a permanent bag on their side. But most patients that have this find that it's really not that bad. It's emotionally very difficult. It psychologically can be very difficult, but the, the technical parts of doing it, of taking care of it, is very simple. If you were to hand somebody a stuffed animal or a doll with this bag on it and say, hey, I need you to change that bag for me, they wouldn't even look up from what they're doing. It's very simple. But you hand them the stuff, I need you to change your own bag or I need you to change your partner's bag or your kid's bag or your parent's bag, it becomes almost impossible the first time. So it's something we work with with them. We, we do training on how to take care of these before the surgery, in the hospital, and then continuing at home with the patient to make sure they learn how to take care of these. Most patients with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis who are very sick, who have to have one of these done, um, whether permanently or temporarily, often they will say, wow, I'm, I feel so much better now that my, whatever my intestinal problem is is taken care of. This bag isn't really that big of a deal because I feel great. I've got a good quality of life. I'm out doing things again. Yeah, I don't, you know, I got a bag on the side. It's, it's a, something to explain, but it's, it, they really find that it's not that big of a problem. Many patients who have fought and fought and fought not to have these will say, man, I wish I had done it sooner. They hear that all the time. Now, obviously, not everybody's going to say that. You could definitely find patients that hate their bag, that don't want anything to do with it, for sure. But there, it, most people find that feeling well is more important than pooping out of their bottom. For people where it's temporary, it's, it's actually usually pretty simple because they, they get through it and they find it really wasn't that bad. And then I, I promised a, a picture about perianal Crohn's disease. I did take out all of the actual patient pictures because that's never a crowd favorite. But that inflammation that can happen around the intestines, the full thickness of the intestine can also happen in the rectum and at, at the anus itself. And full thickness that leads to a perforation in the intestines and leads to a fistula in the intestines can do the same thing leading to an, a a fistula into the fat next to the anus. There's a big fat pad on either side of the anus and that can get a big abscess in it. An abscess is like a really big zit or it's just a, basically a collection of infection. 
and then the patient needs to have that drained. So when you have an abscess here, so this is the rectum, this is the anus. If you were to put a finger in it, it would basically go in like this. You can get a large abscess, like a size of a lemon next, next, to your, next to your cheek or in your cheek, and that needs to be drained. So you basically make an incision over that to get the pus out, which is super painful. And then the patient goes, oh, God, thank goodness. It's, it's definitely, the right home is definitely better than the right in. Um, but these can be very difficult to treat because the problem is that the Crohn's disease is active in this area. So often we do things to um, try to keep the uh, abscess from coming back. The skin will close over. Remember, the skin's not the problem. So as soon as you get this abscess, you pop it with, get the drains out of the skin. The intestines are the problem. So they will continue to have inflammation in them. The skin will close because the skin's really good at closing. And now you end up with a, a collection here again. I think I have killed this. A collection here again. So sometimes to hold the skin open, we will place a little, um, we call it a seton. It's like a little rubber band, which basically looks like this. This is a French word. King Louis XIV had a, had a fistula in Aino, so a lot of the stuff has been named after the French because of that. Anyway. Okay. All right. So I know we're a little bit short on time, but I wanted to just talk about a couple things in just wrapping up about inflammatory bowel disease, specifically Crohn's disease, is we talked about all the medical and surgical stuff today, but as anyone who knows someone who has Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, or uh, if you yourself have it, you know it does take a toll, the ups and downs. Uh, we know many of our patients have a lot of anxiety and depression. There have been several studies that will say anywhere between 30 to 80% of patients with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis may get depressed, have anxiety at some point in their life. And so, you know, we also try to make it a priority to look at our patients holistically. And so we do ask them about these things. We give them resources. Uh, you know, many times you can go see a therapist. There are a lot of support groups. There's a wonderful advocacy group called Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. They have a local chapter. Uh, one of the newest things are, you know, on with since COVID, uh, many of you know there's not a lot of healthcare providers. There's less mental health providers available just due to everything going on in the world. So there's a new company called Trellis uh, that has started an online uh, resilience training program for patients with Crohn's and colitis. And so it's a subscription and on average patients need to do it for four to six months and they have wonderful outcomes. This is evidence-based out of Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is where Dr. Burl Crohn's practice and Mount Sinai is still what is the mecca of IBD treatment in the United States and in the world. And so uh, this is a very good resource. Uh, diet. The diet is one of the biggest questions people will ask us. We could spend hours talking about it. We unfortunately don't have that much time. Uh, but what I wanted to mention are there are certain diets that have been used and there's evidence and data to help support it. So I wanted to go through some of them and you can, you know, read up further on your own or talk to your healthcare provider about it as well. But there's something called elemental enteral nutrition. And so the data is really good for this for those, especially in pediatrics, where it's a special type of uh, nutritional shake. Not, it's not like Ensure, but if you think of Ensure and Boost, uh, but it's worse tasting. And um, that's all the patients can eat. You can't eat anything else. But what it does is it does decrease that inflammation. And in the pediatric literature and some of the early studies, it said it was 60 to 70% efficacious to reduce the inflammation. So it can work. Uh, it's harder sometimes to, you can make kids do anything, right? You can say, this is what you're gonna eat, and that's all you're gonna eat. But for adults, it's a lot harder. I have had a few patients wanting to do this. One actually did not like the taste, so she'd rather got an NG tube in her nose and gave herself the formula that way for three months. So. If you're motivated, you can do it. Um, now, we have some newer data on something called the specific carbohydrate diet that also helps decrease inflammation in Crohn's. Uh, it is a very restrictive diet. It must be done a certain way. You have to restrict certain types of carbs. You can only eat certain types of dairy. You have to make your own yogurt. You have to cut out vegetables. And so 
this is a great diet to decrease inflammation, but don't just Google it and do it on your own. You need to see a dietitian who is well versed in this. In Southern California, the dietitian who's the expert is up at Cedar Sinai. She's hopefully going to be training our group soon too, but we do have that as a diet. And it, we have great data showing that the specific carbohydrate diet does decrease inflammation. So sometimes what she'll do is if a patient is really motivated, she'll do the EEN for a couple months and then uh, transition them, them to the specific carbohydrate diet along with the biologics. And that combination of the diet with the biologics has been shown and we hope to show more of that type of data in the future. Now, Something easier to do is a Mediterranean-based diet. We have a lot of evidence for that, not just in uh, Crohn's, but in cardiovascular health, diabetes health, obesity, hyperlipidemia. And so there is actually a head-to-head -head study done out of University of Pennsylvania where they looked at the specific carbohydrate diet compared to the Mediterranean diet for Crohn's disease. And what they learned in that study was that the Mediterranean-based diet was just as efficacious as the specific car carbohydrate diet easier to tolerate and easier to do. So that could be an option for patients too. And then there's the IBD anti-inflammatory diet. It's basically a modified version of the SCD diet. So there are diets available. For most people, unfortunately, diet doesn't, if you have pretty severe inflammation, diet alone doesn't work. But in combination with everything else, we see really good responses. Now, the future of Crohn's disease management, really exciting. Earlier on in the talk, I talked about the different therapies we have. We are going to get these small molecules for Crohn's, more anti-IL-23s. What we didn't talk about, but really exciting area is treatments for fistulas. And so there are uh, mesenchymal stem cells from a couple different companies that are getting studied for treatment of perianal Crohn's. So Dr. Mills mentioned the fistulas and the best way we treat them right now so they don't you know, cause abscesses again and again is we put that seat on. But in the future, you know, we're going to have that ability where you put that seat on in, cool down the inflammation in the intestines, take out that seat on, inject it with some stem cells, and hopefully that fistula closes. And so that is part of the future. That isn't probably coming up in the next three to five years. The other exciting thing is what we call combination therapy, where we may use not just one drug alone, we may use them in sequence. So either we'll use two biologics together for those with very intractable disease, or we may use one therapy to induce remission and another one to maintain because of safety or the way we give the drugs. And so the Vega and Explorer studies have already been done. And so this data is out there. And so this is exciting to hear. And I just wanted to share that these are the different things that are in the pipeline in the next three to five years. So when we put this together about take home points about how do we choose what therapy and by therapy, I don't just mean medications. We also mean surgery. And so we have to think about the indication, how quickly do we need to get the patient well, looking at the safety, looking at that individual patient and looking at the disease characteristics. So really take home points. It's really important for people with Crohn's disease to have multidisciplinary expert care. You want people who've done that extra training, who know the nuances of the drugs, who know the nuances of the surgery, and who work collaboratively together. Because you know, you know healthcare is getting complicated and you know, you don't want to be the person managing it. You need your team to manage this. It's also important to remember we want to optimize our current therapies. We want to do early intervention. We want to try to do the treat to target model and really use the therapeutic drug monitoring. Also, I cannot say anything. Surgery is not a failure. Surgery is a tool. Many times I'll be like, you definitely need a surgery. My patient will be like, I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I feel bad. I'm like, no, this is not a failure. This is going to allow you to live the life that you want to have. You know, as I said, diet, it's an evolving adjunctive therapy. Mental health really needs to be addressed. But really, it's important to know that the future is bright. This is a hard disease, but so many new things are coming. So we are really excited to be part of that journey. And just one last slide, what we do at UCI. I like people to know what we are doing here for our inflammatory bowel disease program. We have multidisciplinary care. You see me and Dr. Mills presenting today. We do clinic together, all our G IBD uh, GI doctors is always doing at least one clinic a week with a surgeon because it's important for that because many times a patient will be like oh can I come in to see you I have like a pain in my bottom 
I'll look at them like they have an abscess. I walk down the hallway, call the surgeon, they take care of it. If we didn't work together, you'd have to go to a different doctor's office, get an appointment, you know, it gets complicated. So we do believe in that multidisciplinary care. We have expert radiologists who are really good at the imaging. We have expert dermatologists and rheumatologists that we work with as a team in a team approach. Uh, we're in the process of doing a transition of care program with CHOC where the kids who are now too old to be part of their practice are transitioning over to ours. And so we're hoping to de develop a more formalized program we are also very good at interventional IBD. So what that means is, Dr. Mills was talking about these strictures. Sometimes in certain strictures, if they're very short and very small without inflammation, you can stretch them out with a balloon. And so our interventional GI team, we have a strong expert team with that. We are very focused on education, not just for patients, but also for our future, our, our current trainees or the future you know, GIs and future colorectal surgeons. So we have a very robust educational program there. We're heavily involved in clinical trials. We're actually involved in one of the stem cell studies. We are gonna be doing the new biologic therapy studies. And so, and we're also part of a lot of, Cali we're also part of the big California wide IBD consortium. And so, why is that important? We meet other experts, we learn from each other, we learn across databases and things like that. And then we do outreach and advocacy. So thank you very much. We're really sorry we went 10 minutes over time, but thank you for your attention and for having us. And I think Adrian's gonna pass it out for some questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Parrick and Dr. Mills. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. It sounds like it's the best time to have this disease. <laughs> So uh, I will come around now. If you have questions, would you raise your hand and we'll bring the microphone to you. Um, I wondered if the cases of um, bowel disease are increasing and if there are any explanations. And number two, these promising drug therapies, they're probably very expensive. And are they most often covered, or are people left to f find a way to, um, you know, finance? Great the, the question. So to answer the first question, repeat it was, you know, are we seeing more cases of IBD? And we do think, you know, as if that world map, we said it's now in areas where this disease wasn't present. In India, for example, 50 years ago, they didn't have Crohn's disease because in India, if you saw ulcers in the intestines, you thought tuberculosis first, and more commonly, it was tuberculosis. But now, they rule out tuberculosis, and it's Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. And so, the theory behind this is that there's a change in our, our environment. Our environments are very clean and hyper clean, right? If you think about some new parents, they hand wash everything, don't touch my, you know, kids don't eat dirt. If you think about how potentially you grew up, and we're in these hyper clean environments where our bodies are not exposed to these infections. In other countries where all these other infections were going on, parasitic infections, amoebic infections were there, you, it built up your immune system in a way. So I remember one of my mentors, she used to say, let your kids eat dirt, it's okay, uh, because it will help build up your immune system. So we also think there's potentially something with the processing of food, because more and more people are eating processed food. And by, because people are busy, uh, you know, and by that I mean anything that's in a box or a bag. There's some early data showing that the emulsifiers, the guar gum, the carrageen, all those things that help the shelf life of a food product, they weaken the junctions at the cellular level in the small intestine and can potentially increase inflammation. And so when you think of diet for treatment, it's really important to first take out all of that. So take out the Diet Coke, take out the chips, take out the fast food. First do that before you go to specific carbohydrate diet. So there is something we think about the food processing, environmental triggers uh, that do affect it. So we do think about that. Your point about cost of medications is very important because yes, these medicines are costly. Uh, now, if you have private insurance, when a new medication is approved by, an ins by the FDA, if you have a private payer, such as a PPO, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Sigma, Aetna, whatever, you know, the pharmaceutical companies do give copay assistance cards. There's a lot of copay assistance programs. 
The challenge becomes if you're on a government funded program, whether that be Medicare, Medicaid, in Orange County, Caloptima. Medicare does cover certain of these drugs. Caloptima does cover certain of these drugs. And so if you remember my one slide, payers do you know, factor into my decision-making process. So for example, if a patient has Medicare, if you go on an infusion-based therapy, it's all covered. If you go on an injection-based therapy, that won't go under part Medicare Part A and B. It goes under your prescription plan, so your Part D plan. So then that's costly, right? So we have to factor that into our decision-making process. We can't make our patients bankrupt. Thank you. Uh, oh, here we go, over here. Um, I was always wondering, when you have a colonoscopy and you get an upper GI, what can you see in an upper GI? That is a great question. For That's for me. So colonoscopy, we look at the colon, hence the name. Upper GI or EGD or endoscopy are kind of terms we use synonymously. So EGD stands for, the technical term, it's esophago-gastro-duodenoscopy. So it allows us to look at our esophagus, our stomach, and the first part of the small intestine. I, I noticed you had JAK inhibitor on your small molecule slide. You didn't mention how that was being used. I'm just curious because I know there are some JAK inhibitors that have just been coming out for myelofibrosis patients. Yes. And I'm wondering, is that an anti-inflammatory type molecule? So yes, so I didn't go over JAK inhibitors as in depth today because they're not FDA approved yet for Crohn's disease. So I only wanted to talk about FDA approved drugs, uh, but the JAK stat pathway is another pathway of inflammation. So we have a TNA, TNF pathway, an IL-23 pathway, the anti-integrin pathway, JAK stats. And we know if we block in that JAK stat pathway, we have five actually different JAK inhibitors. Uh, or jack receptors that we can block. And so I'm just talking very basic and very general because right now they're not FDA approved for Crohn's. We think they will, will be getting them in the next year. And we're gonna see jack inhibitors, I think coming up for a lot of different autoimmune conditions. Okay, more questions? Oh, here we go. Oh, okay, I'll be right back. <laughs> uh, are any of these diseases related to SIBO? These diseases are not related to SIBO. However, patients with Crohn's disease who've had strictures or surgeries are at higher risk for SIBO. And let me tell the group what SIBO stands for. It's spelled S-I-B-O, and it stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So in our intestines, we have billions of bacteria and we can get an imbalance in our bacteria. That imbalance can come if you take antibiotics for let's say an upper respiratory infection or UTI, it affects your gut and you can get an imbalance in your gut bacteria and you can present with symptoms of constipation, bloating, abdominal pain and discomfort. The way we test for SIBO is a specialized breath test and if we have to measure certain hydrogen and methane levels and once we measure them, if they go above a certain point, then we know you have SIBO and then we treat it with a GI specific antibiotic. So they're not related in that sense, but we do know patients who've had surgery and we see patients who've had Crohn's, who have Crohn's disease are a little bit higher risk for SIBO. Fantastic presentation, thank you. Um, if I, I mean, if, uh, if there was a patient of yours, like a 40-year-old mother who has Crohn's and uh, asks you, how does my daughter or my son prevent this? Um, what would you advise? That's a tough question, but I think, so I think first it's important to understand genetics. So if one, if one parent has the disease, the chance that, that you will pass it on to your child is three to 5%. So it's fairly low. It's not like Mendelian genetics where if you have one parent has a disease, there's a 50% chance you're gonna pass it on. So it's first important to understand that. I think the second thing is 
you have to think about what are the triggers. So you want to try to minimize antibiotics. Don't take antibiotics every time you get an upper respiratory infection. Uh, minimize NSAID use. And I think looking at the diet, let your immune system be exposed to things and looking at your diet. They are doing prevention studies. They're actually doing this study out of Mount Sinai looking at pregnant women and looking at what they're eating in their diet. And then they're going to test the micro, they test the microbiome of the mom. And they're also going to test the microbiome of the baby when they're born. So there are studies. I think we're going to learn more in the next couple of years. Thank you. Any more questions? All right. Well, doctor. Oh, here, one more. This will be our last one. Would you mind giving a definition of the word biologic, how those work exactly? And then um, number two, you said that the steroids are very effective, but you know, serious side effects. Aren't there steroids that are designed not to be absorbed beyond the uh, colon? Okay, so I'm gonna start with your second question first about the steroids. There are various versions of steroids. We can have oral medication versions. We have IV versions. We have topical versions, meaning in the form of a suppository or enema. Uh, and more recently, we do have steroids that, you know, they say they pass the first pass hepatic metabolism. So less of, you get less of the steroid absorption, there's still absorption. And those Two steroids are called, bud they're called budesonides and there's different formulations. One formulation of budesonide is called entacort and that releases in the ileum and then the right side of the colon. And the other formulation of budesonide is called eucerus and that only releases in the colon. So when we, then that's why, you know, Dr. Mills and I both mentioned it's important to know where the disease is so then we know which drug to target it. So even in that simple formulation of budesonide, there's two different versions. Biologics are basically monoclonal antibodies that are engineered. So if you remember in the first picture, I showed it was very complex science picture of the actual monoclonal antibody of infliximab, adalimumab, and sertilizumab. And so because they are considered biologics and they build up immunogenicity, so certain patients, you know, initially they may respond to the drug and then over time, you know, sometimes they build up antibodies. So we learned a lot about antibodies during COVID, right? When people got COVID or they got their vaccines, you want antibodies to an infection because if you get exposed to that infection, you have antibodies to fight it off. If you develop too many antibodies to a drug, then the drug won't work. So biologics also develop antibodies. Small molecules, those JAK inhibitors I briefly mentioned, you can't build up antibodies to them. And so it's the uh, chemical structure of the medication. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Parrick and Dr. Mills. This has been very enlightening for all of us. We thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, our next presentation will be on our aging backs, and that, I believe, is April 24th. <laughs> so I, I look forward one. to seeing you here then. Have a good evening. Huh?